India has pushed the pedal in a bid to accelerate our hopes for a greener future. Our move to green energy has seen a number of government schemes and efforts from the private sector as well. So in the latest, in a bid to aid India's decarbonization efforts, Indian Oil, LNT and Renew Power are coming together to form a joint venture and develop the country's nascent green hydrogen sector. Uh, the companies will hold equal stake in the JV, which will primarily focus on developing and owning green hydrogen assets in India. To to speak more on this and India's broader renewables push, I'm joined by Chairman and Managing Director of Renew Power, Suman Sinha. Uh, Mr. Sinha, great to have you back on the show. Uh, let's begin by talking about the announcement today and how it aids in the larger story and the larger efforts towards a greener future. Yeah, thank you so much, Suman. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Look, I think uh, what is actually emerging now very rapidly is that uh, green hydrogen is going to be a very important uh, transition fuel in the sense that it will really bridge uh, renewable electricity or renewable energy going into a much broader part of the energy value chain. Uh, it, it is a very flexible um, uh, resource. Uh, it can be used for through ammonia into um, a number of areas as feedstock. It can be used as a fuel. It can also, of course, be used in the mobility sector. So green hydrogen is actually a very, very uh, versatile uh, energy um, uh, repository or holder. And uh, the way you produce green hydrogen is essentially a very simple process. You just have to pass electricity through water. You separate that out into hydrogen and oxygen. And that electricity that is passed is actually used uh, through or uh, produced by renewable energy uh, sources, and therefore it's green. So all of this, therefore, uh, ends up producing very a very, very clean energy source in the form of green hydrogen. And that, therefore, is going to be extremely important in India's uh, and, in fact, the world's energy transition efforts as we go forward. So to my mind, therefore, green hydrogen is a very significant uh, game changer and will really allow us to get into a number of areas of the energy transition that otherwise might have been difficult to get to. Uh, and it also therefore expands by a huge measure the amount of renewable energy capacity that we require mm. to make that green hydrogen. So it's actually quite a, quite a long-term positive thing for uh, the Indian economy as well. Absolutely. But having said that, um, Mr. Sanad, there's a report recently that India is set to miss its renewable energy target of 175 gigawatts by the end of 2022. Um, can you put in context that we have all of these great ideals, great plans, investments and money and the push going towards moving to renewable energy. But what is the situation on ground which makes implementation challenging? And do you agree with the assessment I spoke about from this report? Look, uh, the reality is that if the Indian government had set a target of getting to 175 gigawatts of wind and solar uh, and some other renewables by 2022, and that number is obviously going to be missed. Now, the reason for that are several. Uh, number one, of course, is the fact that COVID slowed down a lot of implementation. Over the last two years, we actually could not get a lot of the projects implemented. And it's not just renewable energy projects. Keep in mind that it's also transmission infrastructure that had to be built out that got delayed. So I think that is something that has caused some of the delays. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to catch up on a lot, a lot of that over the next year or two. So I think you'll see uh, some, some increased um, uh, capacities getting commissioned over the next couple of years' time, and that will hopefully allow us to catch up. The second reason really is that we have a fundamental problem, which we all are aware, which is the nature of our distribution utilities. And I've spoken about that many, many times, and the reality is that that is a problem. Uh, our distribution utilities, unfortunately, are owned and run by the central government, by the state governments of India. They're not in the control of the, of the central government. And they have their own timelines about buying power and, uh, and how they want to buy it and so on. And all of that is unfortunately also leading to a slowdown in implementation of renewable energy projects and actually any kind of projects. And frankly, you would like you to see uh, fairly significant shortages emerging over the next two, three years uh, in the power sector because the utilities have not unfortunately planned out their power purchase requirements over the next uh, several years properly. So I think unless this structural issue is resolved of the state of the utilities being in the hands of the state governments and a lot of them being run for 
non necessarily fully commercial reasons this is always going to be a problem that is going to be devil the indian power sector um, so to add to some of those issues that you have uh, talked about mr sinha we also have a new taxation structure which has come into place from the 1st of april uh, specifically in the context of solar power and the import of certain components required for solar power the idea is to encourage the local industry but you know when we speak to players on the ground they do talk about um a gap between when all of these components will be available locally and the high charges they will now have to pay what do you think is going to be the impact in the short term for the move to solar yeah look this is certainly an issue i agree with you that uh, we now have customs duties on solar panel imports which makes it expensive um, and at the same time there are various projects that have to be commissioned fairly soon and there simply is not enough domestic production capacity and so to that extent either those projects will have to get delayed and the government will have to condone those delays uh, or frankly i really don't see any other solution uh, because the customs duty is now has come into effect and it's you know some of us were uh, were uh, were asking for it to get postponed so that in fact this issue would not be as acute as it might become now look the government i think is cognizant of this and that is why they have allowed a six month extension uh for um, the um uh on, on certain other measures that were there uh to allow the imports of uh, solar modules uh for some of the cni uh, segment so i think to some extent the government is trying their bit to relax some of these constraints but i do agree with you that unless we have a lot of new capacity develop uh we'll see a slowdown in solar installations um uh, mr sinha you've recently also taken over as asa jam president Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it would be interesting to get your perspective on industry which is now facing a quite an interesting time we've been through three waves of covid-19 and then now we've been hit by a um, uh, you know war which has marred global supply chains once again it's it's another sort of push that industry has faced inflation is um, a big problem and the impact it will have on consumption what is the outlook right now for industry in your view look i think that there is a very uh, uh, kind of a dichotomous situation for indian industry right now on the one hand the domestic economy is growing very robustly uh, demand is picking up especially as uh, as the pandemic waves uh, you know wanes uh, demand is really picking up and we see that for example in our sector in the context of power demand going up very substantially um, and uh, and therefore what we are seeing is that uh at the same time the financial sector has delevered uh and is much healthier corporate balance sheets have by and large delevered as well and so both on the supply side and the demand side there is i think likely to be a fairly good uh, environment for a fairly significant growth going forward so i see i see that happening uh, so from a domestic environment standpoint things are looking fairly robust um having said that you are absolutely right that internationally the environment is not looking that positive obviously there are a lot of risks that are there the first of those are the fact that interest rates are going to start getting increased and liquidity is going to start getting drained out from the system so that's one the second of course is the fact that supply chains are all over the place um, and now with the war in russia the and the ukraine and the um, issues covid issues in china that's not helping either uh, and a bad situation is actually getting worse as a result of that and uh, thirdly of course um, uh, the fact that we have uh the energy shock that is currently upon us so all of that is really making the external environment a lot more difficult to deal with uh and the question is how much of that will be passed into india uh either through the export sector or the or the external sector um versus uh, for example uh, dollars uh, leaving the country and therefore the rbi having to take some action so we don't know how much of that get will get transmitted into india or in the form of higher inflation so we have to wait and see so i think it's a little bit of a of a both a good thing happening on on the one on so on the one hand and i think a negative external situation on the other hand so i think both of those will play themselves out but i would say by and large to be honest i am relatively bullish about the near term uh, business environment in india over the next several years uh, but mr sana does that bullishness translate and i'm not talking about you in particular to india inc now 
sort of focusing on increasing private investment. That, that has been uh, one area of concern over the last many years, and COVID-19 compounded all of that. There was caution. One didn't know if demand would return. Do you think the mood is changing? I certainly think so. I think the mood has been changing over the last uh, many months. Uh, and as I said, with uh, the economy growing at 8% last financial year and looking at 7 to 8% this year, and as I said, there are these structural reasons as to why I think now the economy is set for above trend growth for the next several years. So I, you know, from that standpoint, certainly I am positive. And there are many sectors that are showing that uptrend. As I said, the power sector, which is in some ways an input sector into so many other sectors, is showing a significant improvement. And that, therefore, is uh, to me an indicator that the rest of the economy is also uh, starting to do well. And there are many sectors where you'll start seeing this reflected in the infrastructure sectors. Road building is at an all-time high. Real estate prices are going up, especially on the commercial side. Um, and, you know, you look at the, that'll feed into the cement sector and so on. So I think there are many sectors where you see this happening. The financial sector is also, by and large, doing very well. So I think uh, overall, I think all the indications are fairly positive. Uh, what about the crude shock? We spoke about the crude shock uh, briefly, but I, I think it deserves a, a little more um, uh, analysis, Mr. Sinha, in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of the sectors that you described doing well are also in part of uh, high input costs and inflation that they have to also pass on. Do you think India is poised to withstand this crude shock? And in a sense, do you think it will be the right push we need to hasten our renewable energy plan? Yeah, look, I, I totally uh, agree with you uh, that um, uh, certainly this is an area of concern. Uh, obviously, India is very impacted by oil prices. But the, I think the good news is, look, oil prices have gone up to a high of 135, 140. They've now trended back to about 105. The U.S. has decided to release its strategic petroleum reserves. So that alleviates the supply situation a little bit more. And, um, and look, the Indian rupee, despite this, has been relatively steady, which I think shows the fact that our external our trade and trade and services sector is doing very well um, and um, uh, capital flows continue to happen at a fairly robust level as well. So I think uh, as long as the rupee stays stable, that, you know, that cuts one sort of level of transmission into of inflation into the Indian economy. Uh, and I, my suspicion is that, you know, once the whole conflict situation settles down, which hopefully will happen soon enough, then you'll start again seeing a correction in oil prices. So to my mind, some of these things are temporary in nature and will not lead to structural uh, price increases in India and therefore will not really cause a significant inflation shock uh, in the long run. So I would be, you know, I would be um, uh, cautiously optimistic about the fact that the energy shock will not be too negative for, for India to handle this time. And the economy is a lot stronger. Now, as far as the move to renewable energy is concerned, of course, I mean, that is an absolute given. And I was at the International Energy Agency conference in Paris just about 10 days ago. And the topic of conversation is really about uh, how do you meet energy security needs in the short run, which may need a short run ramping up of your fossil fuels. But in the longer term, there has to be a very, very clear push towards renewables, mm. which can be within your borders, green hydrogen. And those things are really, really going to see a very significant uh, speeding up in their implementation, not just in India, but everywhere in the world, because this whole issue of energy security is now going to add to the climate change imperative, and both are going to move uh, the whole area of renewables and clean the clean energy transition much, much faster now. All right. One can only hope so. Thank you so much, Mr. Sinha. Pleasure as always to speak with you on the show. Thank you, Tamanda. Thank you so much. Thank you.